Welcome to the ISC webinar, connecting you with experts in the ICT industry to help transform network infrastructure for today and tomorrow. I'm Sharon Volman, Editorial Director of ISC Magazine and ISC Expo. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar titled Speed, Accessibility, and Productivity, How to Prepare Your Legacy Fiber Management Data for G Digital Transformation. This is presented in partnership with Fetro. As you know, today's operators are in the midst of historic growth. They're dealing with an unprecedented an unprecedented level of activity around planning, building, and operating fiber networks. Therefore, they need technological solutions that automate workflows, leverage existing systems, and enable a truly modern pace of business. In this panel, we'll present a clear, a set of clear attainable steps that operators can take to get their network data ready for digital onboarding. We'll also discuss an event-based approach to defining operational data needs that form the foundation for a truly integrated software ecosystem. Finally, our panel of Vetro data engineering experts will discuss how to apply these principles and how to measure your readiness for digital migration. Before we get started, please remember to renew or subscribe to ISC Magazine to stay informed in this ever-changing industry. Get your copy, print, or digital, or both. Simply subscribe by going to iscmag.com, subscribe today. And don't forget about your 24 seven resource, the online ISC Buyer's Guide. We've gathered proprietary information and categorized the latest wi wireline and wireless products to make your job easier, easier and your network better. Visit ISC Mag, excuse me, ISC Buyer's Guide. I can't talk, isebuyersguide.com. Today's webinar is brought to you by Vetro Inc. Vetro builds software that makes it radically simpler and faster for broadband providers to plan, design, build, and operate their fiber optic networks. Vetro's map, Vet, Vetro's map-based SaaS platform is easier to use and more powerful than traditional tools and enables network providers, owners, operators, and such to benefit from a modern, integrated, and connected digital hub for their physical network assets. Vetro delivers internet infrastructure intelligence. Now, let me tell you a bit about today's panelists. Joining us from Vetro are Will Mitchell, co-founder and chief executive officer. Will's deep experience in GIS system design, deployment, and operations, as well as his technical and applied business experience, enables him to deliver high value geospatial business insight and product vision. As the CEO of Vetro, Will leads a diverse technical team delivering a transformational and category expanding fiber management software platform. Another wonderfully um, experienced panelist is J.D. Doyle, the CTO of Vetro Inc. J.D. brings 27 years of experience leading the development of large cloud, cloud data and analytic solutions, as well as a history of successfully scaling startup engineering groups. He brings a track record of delivering disruptive technology products and analytics to market in the renewable energy, mobility, fintech, transportation and communication markets. Will Jonas is senior technical project manager. Will recently joined the Vetro team and specializes in GIS data conversion and migrations. With over eight years of experience working with different GIS software, Will has a strong foundational knowledge to bring to the team about how to re merge real world scenarios into the GIS world. And our facilitator for today is Victoria Carroll. She's Senior Product Market Manager for Vetro Inc. Victoria has worked at Vetro for over five years and has two decades plus of technical product packaging and sales experience. So now we're almost there. Before, before we dive into the content of today's webinar, we recommend you view the webinar in full screen mode for the best visual quality of our presenter slides. You can do this by clicking on the two outward arrows at the top of the right-hand corners of the slides. Also, you can get more information about our sponsor and our speakers by clicking, clicking, 
clicking boy, the information tab at the top. My favorite part of the webinar is actually the interactivity. So please consider asking your questions throughout the presentation. We'll hold all of the questions until the end and Victoria will moderate the questions. Now, thank goodness, because I can't seem to talk, I'm grateful to hand over the um, facilitator role to Victoria. Thank you all for joining. I'm excited to learn more about this uh, topic today. Great, thank you so much for the awesome intro, Sharon. Um, there have been many days when I trip over my own words through pretty much everything I do. So I'm, I'm with you and I support, um, you know, not being able to talk. Um, <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> one thing before we kind of get started too is um, if you're looking at our video right now, we've been joined by Allison Hutchison and she is our lead GIS engineer. So she is the person who is building the ETL machines to pull data into Vetro. And um, she was a last minute addition to our team, but at Vetro, we like to go high quality, even if uh, it's a surprise. So, so we've got um, the best of the best on the call today. Um, and thanks for being with us, Allison. So I'm gonna start with some slides here and, okay, great. So um, we've already gotten a pretty great intro from Sharon. So I'm gonna just kind of skip over the beginning part, but I did wanna pause briefly on slide two here um, and just, recap our expert team. So we've got Will Mitchell, our co-founder and CEO, JD Doyle, who is our CTO, Will Jonas, our customer success and solutions manager, and Allison Hutchison, our geospatial data engineer, and me, Victoria Carroll. I'm your product marketing manager here at Vetro. So um, at Vetro, we make fiber management software, and we've been in the GIS fiber mapping game since 2008. And one of the challenges we help our customers with is the transformation of their legacy OSP network data which can come in many shapes and forms. Uh, and we migrate that into the highly structured, consistent and precise environment of our fiber management platform. Um, the dedicated engineers, designers and leaders that are building the next generation of fiber internet as operators are always telecom experts, but they're not always GIS experts. So that's where we come in. We want to share how everyone working in fiber can think like GIS and get more value out of the data we rely on every day. So let's get started. Just a quick note as we dive in, um, we kind of initially said to hold your questions till the end, but we actually really love tackling hard questions and we'll get to them during the course of our presentation if we can. So if something pops into your head, please do go ahead and add it to that Q&A queue and we will answer it when appropriate and we'll also reserve time at the end to do that more traditional style Q&A. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so if you're on this call, you're probably thinking about upgrading your fiber management system or you've given it some thought anyway. Cloud software solutions are leading digital innovation in the fiber management system space, FMS, we'll refer to it going forward. Our customers push us every day to innovate against challenges both new and old. Um, you know, and we're not the only ones who've noticed that things are changing in that direction. So I'm gonna go over here to this next slide. Don't take our word for it, right? Um, if you attended ISE Expo this year, you may have caught TDS Telecom's Chief Technology Offer Officer Ken Paker's excellent keynote presentation. So during his presentation, he demonstrates that while other areas of telecom have been boosted by cutting edge technologies, engineering and construction are on a slower trajectory towards digital transformation. Many telecom companies are in the process of that transformation now, and he points out to us that there is a massive opportunity to optimize processes around outside plant especially. So, this is actually one of his slides from the presentation, A Match Made in Heaven, Outside Plant and Data Science. He says yes, we say yes. So Ken, we really appreciate you teeing up that session today. Um, it's also recommended viewing, it's on the ISE Expo website if you want a more high level strategic view of this you know, data science uh, presentation. What we're gonna focus on is the more tactical, hands-on, what, what are you actually doing to, to get that uh, migration, that transformation going? So what we want to do is touch on a few of the opportunities that are available to optimize and improve your processes with GIS data science. Um, we're gonna just touch on a few of those really quickly. 
Um, one thing we want to do, all of us, is to make more money. You know, our, our FTTH customers report that within three to six months of onboarding to our digital fiber management solution, Vetro Fiber Map, they're able to connect two to four times the number of homes per month, getting them to that pivotal ROI tipping point a lot faster. And that's just our platform. You know, we don't have data on uh, the other software solutions available in our space, um, but there is a value to bringing in a fiber management platform for that speed and that ability to get to profit faster. Transitioning to a data hub style fiber management system gets you ready for revenue opportunities, whether you're um, expanding, acquiring, or going for funding. So digitizing means you can move faster into revenue mode and offer a better customer experience while you're doing it. Oops, here we go. And then we've got, um, you know, we, we often get questions about the initial investment, like, you know, the, the return on investment here. If I go ahead and do this, like, what am I getting back? Um, so there is an initial investment when it comes time to digitize. Change, unfortunately, usually needs a budget. But once complete, the accessibility integration options and speed that cloud computing offer are really unmatched. Plus, your whole organization benefits from a few less data storage and management destinations in the course of work. A study published by Tech Republic reports that the average operational employee across all industries, not just fiber management, loses about an hour and a half every day moving between about 35 different software applications. It's kind of a shocking number when you, when you hear it, right? But if you think about the course of your day, how many times are you going between one thing to another thing to another thing? Swivel chairing. So reducing that time loss by even a fraction adds up to a lot of time and labor savings as your project moves down the road. And the complex business processes that drive your organization, things like budgeting, forecasting, and risk management, whoops, here we go, I think I'm supposed to be on this one, and risk management, they always offer more value when they're informed by real world reliable data. So much so that IDC Research published survey results about this very topic. Operations leaders report improvements to their company's profit outcomes of up to 46% simply by switching over to a digital hub for their critical data. Digital fiber management platforms take this a step further by giving you the tools to engage with your data, extract insight, and eliminate guesswork so you get that big picture view you can trust with granular control and visibility. And finally, let's talk about your team. One of the big benefits of cloud fiber management is that it will make your team happy. We're living through a historically tight labor market made even tighter for open telecom roles that require significant education, skill, and experience. So keep the team you have happy, multiply their talent, and give them the ability to do more with software made specifically for fiber. Fiber management reduces app switching, errors, and lost time on repetitive or duplicative tasks. Plus, in our work from anywhere and everywhere new normal, the ability to collaborate remotely in real time is one of the big reasons cloud fiber management is the right choice for growing organizations. So how does fiber management get you there? You know, how does it work, right? So we have this diagram that I'm going to go through really quickly to kind of explain um, not just the sort of value of fiber management, but how it functions. On the left, we kind of have five key components of data workflows starting from the bottom. You've got your source of the data. So when there's a catalyzing event, you know, from whom or where does the data change originate? I'm going to use field ops as uh, an example here just to make it simple, um, well, relatively simple, uh, and we'll follow the arrows from there. So now let's go up to format. So what is the format of your data? In understanding and using your data, format is one of the biggest challenges. You might have your connectivity information in spreadsheets or text files or you know, stored in a Google Drive somewhere, whereas you're probably using some kind of a GIS um, application for your geometry and your uh, the shape of your network. What does it look like? Where does it sit on the map? So, you know, even just unifying those two specific formats um, provides a lot of value. Now let's move up to the channel. So how does that data get into your current storage system? What communication methods are being used to transfer and share data? Some of them are probably pretty good, right? Like we've got mobile apps, we've got integrations, we've got other business systems. But then we get into things like phone or in person, you know, like the channel almost dictates that the storage is gonna be a little less reliable or that there's gonna be data loss simply because you know, when it comes to things like texting a photo or having a conversation, things get lost in the mix. Now let's get up to storage. So where are you keeping the data that you collected? 
you know, it's important to note that most of us, I mean, honestly, I suffer from this too. I do a lot of graphic design and I've got images all over the place. When you are going to do something complex, top line here, where we're looking at ongoing operations or deployment, you're planning your capacity, you are doing risk management, you're doing inventory, whatever it is, complex business processes require you to have access to a broad array of data that is all tied to your network. So when you're going to do that, you might have to go around collecting things from different places. Maybe you're logging into a couple of apps, maybe you're pulling up some files on your drive. You could even be um, like a few of our customers have done and have like the three ring binder or you know notebooks or a folder somewhere. So it slows down your ability to do things like forecasting or budgeting or whatever it is that you're up to because you have to find what you need. So here's where fiber management fits in. When you add a digital fiber management system of record, you remove the need for different channels and different storage containers for your data. So you're inherently sort of like um, decreasing the amount of complexity in the data flow and the work that you have to do to get to those complex business processes, right? So you're going to do your inventory, guess what? Now you just have to log into one thing, your fiber management system. Everything's simpler, it's faster, it's consistent, which is really, that's the word of the day. I'll say that in advance, that's a spoiler alert. Um, and it's under control, meaning that you have uh, the ability to say, hey, this person gets to log in and change these things, whereas this person can only view it, right? So everybody in your organization has access to the information, but they have the appropriate access to their information. So it's an exciting proposition for telecom operators who are feeling burdened by the amount of information that they're carrying, specifically, you know, when in the building process, you're getting construction data from maybe a number of different sources and needing to kind of like consolidate, centralize, and create that master record of what your data, uh, excuse me, of what your network looks like out in the real world. So with that, I'm gonna kick off a little uh, conversation here with our panel because what we're gonna talk about next is how to do it. So when talking with a couple of our experts here, they said you have to build a bridge between where you are today and where you want to get to. So Will Jonas, since that, I think it was something that you said, I thought I would you know, kick it off to you and just talk about this concept. Like what does that bridge building look like and where can you start if you're not a GIS person? Sure, thanks VK. Yeah, so when we're when we're talking about building a bridge, we really are talking about you know building this this connection or this mapping between your existing system and the digital system that you're moving towards. So the things that we really focus on are your legacy data, you know everything from the format to the um, the the storage type, the file types, the but really also the attributes and the key pieces of information that you want to you know, really migrate to a new system. Um, and so this, this becomes a process where we're working closely with clients, trying to understand their data. We're relying on their experts. Um, sometimes they're relying on people to verify things in the field. And there's all, always unknowns when we talk about you know, legacy data. Sometimes it's stored in various places. Sometimes it's stored in various systems. Sometimes it's stored on paper still. So we really work with clients to help understand where they're starting from and, and where they want to be. And from there, it becomes a lot clearer for us to help map that data to a platform and to specific layers where you can really start to visualize and, and see the power of all your data organized properly and the information that you, that you need and that you rely on and that your field techs or operators rely on a day-to-day -day basis. So... That's what we're talking about when we're building this bridge. And it, it, it really is a process and it's an iterative process many times where we're, we're working back and forth. We're, we're doing different uh, processes, you know, kind of a couple different times to ensure that we're capturing all the information that you have in your original systems of record. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, at a high level what we're trying to achieve when we are talking about, you know, building that bridge between your systems. Awesome, thank you, Will. Um, and in thinking about that iter iterative process, that's a great word uh, to try and say on days when you can't talk. Um, I, like, I'd love to hear from you, Allison, a little bit about what that's like, you know, and, and where the sort of 
iterations start to happen, right? Um, I'm thinking that it's somewhere after you've gotten into somebody's data when you're kind of, you know, going going back and reviewing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, VK. Yeah, um, so that's that's exactly right. Um, we've dealt with you know, quite a few customers where, hey, let's just get the data in there. Let's, let's see what we're dealing with. Um, and then do kind of like a like a, a back and forth of like, what are you trying to capture, you know, with your data? What do you want to represent? What assets are you tracking? Um, and then on top of that, like what other things that you're tracking? Like if you want to track um, the the amount of customers that you have that are lit or, or custom clients that are maybe in the field, the, the connection went bad. Um, but as far as like getting the original data like into Vetro or or any other platform for that matter, um, it really is just like a like a you want to talk to someone that knows the web, the the entire network one hundred percent or close to it, so that you so that both parties can understand how best to get that data in there. Awesome, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I think so, uh, you know part of the battle there, VK. Just real quick, is that you know we're oftentimes speaking different languages when it comes to this process right so that's a big part of it is just getting on the same page you know understanding what you know their pedestal is called versus what we might call it in a different system and, and really you know kind of having that data dictionary and, and defining those um, those terms and so we're speaking the same language and that's that's a big part of this initial process to, to kind of map out how the data should be represented yeah, that's great. And, you know, I think that when we were talking about this, somebody mentioned the idea that, like, you really just have to know as much as possible about where you are today and how things look today versus knowing how things are supposed to look on the other side, right? That's the job of the people who are helping you with data migration. So, you know, thanks, Allison, for bringing that up, that the person who has, like, legacy data or, like, institutional knowledge, we'll call it, um, you know, is really valuable in this process. Yeah, hey, Victoria. Yes. Oh, sorry about that. If you go back, I just wanted to chime in on this. Was, yeah. We were talking about um, going from a, a current state into a future state, a future state being a fiber management system where you're in a database that's you know built to manage fiber documentation, fiber records. The source side of that equation or that coin can be such a variety of stuff, you know, and I think it's it's just worth noting that we've run into folks over time that have records uh, anywhere from, you know, in somebody's head that need to be drafted or written down originally. Maybe next step would be paper maps. And I, I date myself a little bit by reflecting on my early days in GIS of uh, using a, a tablet and a digitizing puck and taking paper maps and clicking on every node and vertex to transfer that that uh, paper record into digital form into GIS uh, to begin with. It's horribly tedious. Nobody wants to do that. But, uh, you know, sometimes that's where you're starting from. Um, and then uh, that can be done at mass scale. I mean, I had friends uh, went into shift work, you know, digitizing FEMA floodplain maps and 50 people going uh, 24 hours a day, like did mass digitization. A lot of that got automated. You know, this was a long time ago. And... Um, and typically in the fiber uh, context that we're dealing with, you, that's not the start point. There might be an old telephone company with paper records still, paper maps, and that's cool. That can be digitized in that old form, uh, scanned and, and in some some ways automated, really digitized. But then more often than not, you're, you've got Google Earth or you've got desktop GIS or you've got AutoCAD. And all those become challenges of... Um, schema structure standardization uh parsing of layers and, and, and making sure everything's organized in a way that can be bulk ingested into that fiber management context just a little reflection on on what we see out there every day yeah and you actually teed up the next slide perfectly um which is you know what goes into building that migration bridge that we just referred to right we're here to kind of you know go through actual steps that you can take to get ready for this migration so starting, I think, with like the three key elements um, is important. So, you know, number one would be an organized system of discrete data sets, um, meaning, you know, your network is probably a pretty big chunk of data, breaking it down into pieces that are logical and make sense and consistent is a great place to start. Um, you want to have standard nomenclature that is consistent across all of your documentation. So 
misspellings or um, jargon or, you know, I do this a lot. Like I name things sort of joke, jokingly and it doesn't make sense to anybody else, right? You want to make sure that that standard naming convention kind of runs through everything that you have. And then the last thing is linked object identification keys. And this is a relatively new concept to me. So I'm going to kick it back to the GIS experts to talk a little bit more about that and why that's important um, to connect your connectivity data to your geometry. Who wants to take yeah, that? Really yeah, there you go. I can start, I guess. Um, yeah, really, when we're when we say linked object identification keys, a lot, lots of times, you know, we can we'll get a database or we'll get um, some format of data that does have some. It may be the customer, or the the person doesn't even realize it, but there is typically a way to link different objects. You know, that could be by building out names or using common nomenclatures, and sometimes it, it is an actual identification or ID value from, you know, one table that's linked to another table. And that becomes very helpful and, and sometimes critical in ensuring uh, that the, the migrated data is is accurate, that we're linking, that, you know, we're, we're putting the splitter in the right handhole or the right pedestal or putting the ported equipment in the right location. And this becomes, you know, kind of a crucial part of of understanding your data and just making sure that we have, you know, solid logic and business or not business rules, but rules that we can apply to, you know, this data set belongs to this data set, or there's a link between these two features and these two types of data. And that way, you know, from there, someone like Allison can confidently build a tool based off that logic. And, and we know that the data is getting placed and linked to the correct location an asset is, you know, is properly contained together if, if that's how the representation is in the real world. I don't know, yeah, Allison, awesome. you deal with that a lot. I, I'll just, I'll just, I just want to make a comment just stating that the more work you put into, um, if it's not already in an easily digestible format for like the connectivity side of things, um, the more, the more effort you put into that, the easier it's going to be for any of these fiber management systems to integrate and load that data instantly into their into the platforms. That's a really good point. And once again, you guys are doing all the heavy lifting for me because you just kind of queued up the next point that I want to make, which is that there's a human element to this process, right? We think of digital migration and transformation as something that is like robots, machines, computers, they're taking care of it. There's a, a data scientist like Allison on the back end who's changing things, but you know, us as you know laymen or whatever you want to call it civilians in terms of gis don't really have to think about it but at the end of the day everything you document comes through human hands at some point so getting started starts with getting organized and the, the number one thing is coming back to that who's in charge um making sure that you know like who the person who has the most information about that network stored in their head so that they can make those rules that will and allison were referring to um if they exist or identify the rules that already exist and point them out um, make sure that all the documentation is clean um, and really make decisions about the data migration you know like what do they want to happen here what what are the goals let's tie the goals back to what's happening during this migration project um, you know, and then what? So like, what is each team member responsible for? So you want to identify a leader, but you're going to need some supporting people to help with things like data hygiene or just, you know, editing, cleaning things up, moving things around. Um, so starting just with the team is a great place to start. And a step that I think a lot of us don't really think about, um, you know, think about preparing in terms of like the human element. The third thing is where are you going to put stuff? So one thing that I've noticed is that we have a lot of customers who kind of complain or whatever about duplicates. Um, I had to leave the site early and somebody edited something while I was gone and then I edited it back at the office and now there's two separate documents and we're not 100% sure which is which. So one of the things you can do to kind of start clean is create a brand new space to hold all of your stuff while you're waiting to do your migration. So as you go things go through things and check them and, and you know clean them up, put them somewhere discreet and just make sure that you know the right people have access to it and that it can kind of stay in that nice clean format until you're ready to go. Um, the when, so what is most important here? A lot of operators 
approach their network in a really unique way. You might define your neighborhoods in one way while another operator might define them in another way. So the question is, you know, do you have priorities? Are certain neighborhoods or zones or areas more important than others? Are there data sets that need to go first? Are there ones that can go later? So having that order already established when you come to the migration process is really valuable because it's going to help you go a lot faster. Um, and then the why. So what are you trying to get out of this, right? Um, attaching your project to what you're trying to achieve is always really useful. So one thing that we're going to deliver to our audience after this webinar is over is a workbook that has all of the stuff you're going to see from this presentation kind of laid out so that you can get started by, you know, identifying your team, choosing new locations for things, and really tying back to your goals, as well as doing some of your data work and logging all of that as well. So we're excited to offer that as a tool if anybody's going to be, um, you know, embarking on this in the near future. Um, let's see. Oh, and thank you for the question. We will get to that shortly. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide unless my panel wants to pipe up with something I missed. Okay. There we go. So step two. Now you know who your team is, you know who's doing what, and you know we're going to be putting stuff. So you want to start isolating and naming your primary network areas. And what we're trying to show on this slide is this blue diamond here is kind of like a representation of what your network map looks like, quote unquote, you know, a representation of that network map. So you've got your whole network and then you are probably breaking it down into smaller pieces. So when Will and Allison were talking about those naming conventions and that consistency, it's like it kind of doesn't matter what naming convention conventions you use or how you parse it out as long as it's the same either way. So we're demonstrating here that like, you know, for the same network, you might choose to have one field that identifies both the network name and the zone, or you might identify the network name in a different field and put the zone somewhere else, right? So it's just, you know, it doesn't matter as much like the sort of way you do it, but just that it is consistent. Um, so I'm gonna pause here for comments from the panel because I know this is a hot topic. Oh, or maybe it's yeah. not. No, oh, I yeah. mean, it's it's very, very important, I would say. Yeah. It's it's something that we, we constantly deal with. And, and it just, the less that it's consistent, the more exceptions or the more edge cases that we won't be able to programmatically account for. And so it just increases the, the time of delivery. It increases the back and forth with, you know, Allison and, hey, what does this mean? Why is this name differently? We 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 were basing it off this logic and now this is different. So it's just important that the data is standardized and it's consistent and, and kind of like you said, BK, it's, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. There's not, you know, you could argue there's maybe a couple of different better ways or some best practices there, but consistency I think is the key um, because we are building rules and isolating the data and, and ingesting it based off that a lot of times to make sure it goes in the proper location and and is connected and represented accurately. Hey, Will, and BK, the, this, re, this kind of reminds me of something too, the, you know, a lot of uh, folks are building new fiber to the home networks um, in stages and phases and in, in different geographies and neighborhoods. And sometimes, sometimes we're, the mindset has been like, we, we, we got to get everything done at once and we got to get all of our old stuff uh, perfected and ingested at once to uh, begin using a, an FMS, a fiber management tool. Um, I think that the one, the one takeaway that we've learned over the time, over the years is um, just start with an active area, start with phase one, stage one, neighborhood one, polygon one, uh, yeah. CO one, cabinet one, what have you, and, um, and you know you can begin to get value out of that system of record um, right from the get go, uh, and then you know tail in all the other legacy ingest that you might need from old network, old records. So um, don't have to do everything at once. You can break it down into uh, a se sequential ingest um, scenario and uh, get 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 going in fiber management right away. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of times, Allison, she'll she'll do that very thing. You know, she'll she'll build out of like a vertical complete solution right in that area, and we'll get the customer to say, "Yeah, this looks great. This, everything's connected properly." And once she knows that this is accurate, then it's like, "Okay, we have the tool. Let's just let it rip on the rest of the data." So, you know, getting that one really accurate area established 
up front is is often a, a good strategy to that way you know we're not spending time bringing in things and then oh this is all wrong you have to go back and fix it all like let's let's get one area established as being accurate and represented correctly and then we can go at the rest of the data it's a great point that, that is an excellent point too because um you know once patterns are established and consistency of source is uh, pinned down uh, enough to execute on one area. Generally speaking, um, a, a good data science or data migration team is gonna be uh, fanatically focused on uh, automation and repeatability. And so it, it might be that once you break through that first neighborhood, the rest come fast. And, and uh, I, for one, am pretty impatient. I don't like to, let projects go on for months and months. Like we, we like to work fast and, and bring stuff in fast. So when we can identify patterns and automate uh, solutions, uh, that's, you know, that speeds things up a lot. That's actually a great segue into um, the question that we have from David. Thank you so much. When mapping legacy data, are you coding a solution from scratch, have custom tools or something like FME? So Allison, that's a question for you. Do you want to talk about your process a little bit? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it all depends. It depends on the uh, how well you know the schema of these data sets you're trying to bring in. Um, we, uh, uh, we personally have done, we've used uh, FME, we've used, uh, we, we've mainly used FME for like the rapid prototyping stage. It's very easy to use that tool to do uh, things like that. And once you understand the schema and the network and how everything is supposed to connect together like a puzzle, um, then you could start maybe thinking beyond that, maybe making like a, a Python like pipeline or uh, using uh, an Amazon web service uh, for scraping and stuff like that to greatly enhance getting data into a FMS platform. And uh, JD, I, we were talking inter, interplanetary travel and you said something about Jupiter. Is that uh, relevant here? Yeah, absolutely. So there's all kinds of new tools uh, that, that like Allison just referred to in terms of putting these in Python, having Jupyter notebooks to kind of store these things. These can actually document not only your network, but they can also document the whole process, right? They, it's kind of a like a more of more than code way of thinking about documenting this whole migration step. So, you know, kind of what thought process you went through as well as how you actually do it. And you can kind of keep those and uh, share them. And then, you know, should you have to change it in the future to try a slightly different implementation from a different customer, uh, that, thing can, that can be used uh, as a, as a basis. Great, thank you so much. So let's move into the kind of step three part of this, um, which is to inventory and package your data. So, you know, my experience has been that once you have committed to doing something, you kind of need to find everything first, right? So you want to go through and just inventory what you have, right? Um, this is actually a little screenshot, um, a little slice of screenshot from our workbook that offers columns and a way to kind of classify that data as you go through it. Um, but yeah, that would be kind of the way to go. So in our example here, we're looking at just one zone of our Northeast um, fiber network. Um, and we're just inventorying that one piece, right? Like kind of keeping it uh, succinct and eventually, yes, you know, everything has to be married together, um, but breaking it down is less intimidating. You can kind of, you know, work with a smaller data set uh, versus trying to take everything on in one lump, lump sum. Um, so in terms of the kind of like inventorying and packaging, packaging, we just mean, you know, put everything that's related in a single place and note that it is related for now um, before you get into the kind of cleanup stage and start thinking about the deeper rules. So I wanted to pause here again, you know, just find out from our panel about what this process looks like when you work with customers. You know, are we, um, are we typically kind of like finding that we have sort of half GIS data, which is regimented due to having been in a GIS platform. It offers certain um, data fields that are going to just automatically be really consistent and complete because of that platform being in place. Um, and, you know, then when like the spreadsheets and other things come in, you know, how do you look at kind of like putting it all together and making sure that's all consistent? Yeah, we, we do see, I mean, you know, GIS data, spatial data, whether it's shape files, KMZs, you know, um, or Google Earth, 
you know, coming out of those types of systems. It's a lot more common AutoCAD than I'd say it used to be. Um, and so we do we do get a lot of clients who do have access to, to GIS data in some, some way or another, or they'll have a spreadsheet with coordinates. And I think linking those, it really gets back to, you know, having those those key identifier fields or being able to define those really solid foundational requirements of how to connect the data and, and how the data um, is related in, in a lot of aspects of, you know, one field is linked to another field or this piece, you know, goes along with this piece. So just, I think, understanding, you know, what good data looks like, understanding the, the requirements um, and establishing those up front and having that kind of solid uh, data that we can build logic off of is where this kind of occurs. Awesome. And then from there, it's kind of like the hard part, right? We're going into the making it consistent and complete. So this is where you're getting your hands dirty and getting into that data and looking for those things that we've been kind of referring to, right? Duplicates, missing records, misspellings, consistent naming or inconsistent naming, consistent structure, um, you know, accuracy and up-to-date data. So there's probably work to do somewhere on some of these things. You know, we have a term that we use here at Vetro called documentation debt. Um, many of the operators that we work with have some piece of documentation that just hasn't been done yet, right? It's like maybe it's recent or maybe it got skipped over because there was a, a crisis time or something busy going on, right? And, and uh, you know, we got to go back and do it. So getting those pieces of documentation debt remediated, making sure that you have that consistency throughout your documents. Now that you've gone through and you've kind of packaged it all together, you're kind of working from a place where you're saying, okay, great. Like now I need, to, now I know that I need to make all of this stuff consistent. So any like tips or advice, we're looking at a very beautiful um, uh, splice record here, I think. And, um, you know, it, it's very consistent and like, this is sort of, you know, what we'd be looking for. Um, and I just wanted to kind of pause and see if, you know, our panel has any comments before we get into kind of the fun part, which is where you get to build your solution. Um, we'll talk about that next. Sure, VK. I'll I'll just take a quick yeah. jump into here. Please I do. mean, this is a classic data science problem. And like every data scientist and every data science groups, the first thing you deal with is you have to clean your data. And I think why it's important, like data cleanliness is is always the first cha challenge. And sometimes it's a lot of what data scientists do, right? To clean things up. For you know, for this uh, use case, I think the real issue revolves around like you realizing up front, being proactive here and getting after this, because what we find is when there's when data is not clean or not consistent, it causes interaction interactive back and forth. Like you you know you kind of make some progress to a point and then you hit a new uh, you know field that doesn't work and suddenly you're stuck and then you have to have a communication back and forth between uh, you know both vendors if you will and then you get to the next level. So you have this really kind of slowly iterated process where. Uh, the more you can do in preparing it to make it consistent and realizing that the consistency here will flow to consistency in the process. Shorten that communication time. Anytime you communicate, you're going to lose time and efficiency. So if you can, if you, anything you can do yourself to do that, even if you have to make assumptions and things, because sometimes you might just free up the process for something that could be updated and, and, uh, and uh, you know, adjusted, if you will, in the new system, right? But getting it in might be just as important. Yeah. That's a great point, JD. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to the sort of like, you know, end product, like, um, you know, when something does kind of come through and you're looking at a map maybe that has something that's a little bit off because there was a missing field or, you know, something just didn't quite get through right, you know, um, like what you're talking about in my mind is clearing the road. So, you know, you're you're diminishing those times that you'll hit a hit a wall, but maybe that wall won't show up until you're looking at the end product. So, um, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about like the process of what it means to kind of like finish and then kind of backtrack a little bit? Sure. Because what I was referring to and and, uh, you know, Allison may have some uh, some some deeper examples. But when you get your data into your new system, whatever that system is, that system may have uh, an exposed database that allows you to query and change that database directly. It may have APIs that allow you to, to write some simple scripts to adjust attributes on, in bulk, for example, or to import something from an external file. Or you might have a bespoke tool for doing some specific fiber-oriented kind of connection. And 
you can't use those until some, some data is in there and you may not be able to get that data in there if it's not complete, right? So getting it to it so it's pseudo complete or, or it's complete but not completely accurate might get it in, into the new system and then give you the opportunity to work on it in the more flexible environment. That's great, thank you. Any other comments before I um, move into like now the sort of choice of fiber management um, and things to ask and um, you know get settled on where you're moving all of this great data that you've cleaned up? Yeah, VK, one more thing on this. I'm looking yeah. at the record uh, or the screenshot on the page and it reminds me this is network data that we're talking about and looking at mostly, but the part of the challenge is goes beyond the network and uh, everyone struggles and wrestles with address data. Um, and it's just worth calling out because the preparation and management of and perfection of, of address data <clears throat> as you know, a, a representation of targets to build to uh, service locations in our context. Um, or customers that sign up for service on a network later. That address, uh, the world of address data, cleanliness, hygiene, and upkeep is is a whole other can of worms, but it's very relevant to what we're talking about. And we, rest, we work on that problem a lot as well. You've got to do address standardization, address validation, geocoding, and then the sort of spatial side of it, perfecting where on the map the, the point lands um, and, and so forth. And, um, and then enrichment where, you know, the, the relationship between that address or service location to the network comes into play. You need to know if it's connected or not, if it's passed or not. And there's some really great stuff that you can do analytically and operationally uh, once you have the data in. So back to your kind of end game, how do you use this stuff? Um, and uh, for some reason that was just on my mind. I was thinking about... Um, uh, dirty data or, or, or we were talking about hygiene and cleanliness of, of this inbound data and uh, JD and I talk a lot about a data pipeline and also a data lake and JD doesn't want any uh, pollution going into that water in this data lake so we got to clean it up on the way in. There you go. I love that metaphor. That's great. I'm going to use that going forward. Um, well, and so that actually, again, tees up the next slide perfectly, right? So when you are thinking about fiber management, you're shopping at that point. So if you've done this data work, you're prepared, you're saying, now I want to find my solution. So you've got to shop for functionality and find a good fit for your organization. So a few things to consider, um, you know, what, again, going back to that who, what, where, when, and why, what do you want from this ideal solution? Know which features, tools, and use cases are need to have, should have, and nice to have. That's always great. When I'm talking about something, often something that's like not that much of a priority will pop to the forefront because it's just what I was thinking about that day. So organizing your thoughts around what you want from a fiber management solution before you get to the shopping stage is really useful. Once again, it kind of clears the road for everybody, for you most of all, to you know finish making that choice because you can go in and compare apples to apples based on this list that you've prepared for yourself. Um, and consider the results of your data prep too. Like, where did you land? Do you need migration services? Do you need help getting that data into good shape? Or do you feel like you have the team to do it in-house? There's a million different flavors of what that might look like. So, you know, just thinking about what that would look like ideally for you. Um, you know, and obviously a budget associated with that if you do need migration services. And are there any outside data sets that you need to source? So we'll just reference address data, but there's, you know, many other things out there that you might want to bring in. Um, and marry with the network data that you have. Um, and then, you know, how many potential users are there in your organization? How big does your solution need to be? And what other software systems are you using? So does it need to connect to anything else? Are you using like, for instance, like a mobile capture app for field data? Are you, um, you know, is your OSS, BSS, is your provisioning software going to need um, this network data? I mean, you know, the argument is that Yes, it probably does, uh, you know, and so, you know, are your goals to integrate that, to reduce, again, those that need to log into multiple things, to copy and paste and remove that potential for mistakes and errors to be made. Um, so that's just kind of like a top level, you know, approach to shopping for fiber management. And as you get into it, you're going to discover more things that are desirable for you. But Again, you'll have all of these things and actually a little bit more in the workbook that we will circulate. So, you know, make a list and um, 
give us hell. You know what I mean? When you come shopping, we are ready to answer your questions. And, uh, you know, I'm 100% sure that every other fiber management software uh, company is too. So, you know, you're in charge of the shopping process and you should feel like really empowered and like you understand what you want and what you need and like you understand the answers too. So feel free to press. Um, anything else on like shopping for functionality fit before we move into platform architecture? Maybe, okay. I've got a quick thing if you let me yeah. play with your, your little image here. I think one key that we see, and we kind of talked about, you know, finding the perfect fit for your functionality. If you look at this puzzle piece, and anyone that's a puzzler knows that sometimes pieces look like they go together, but they don't, right? And I think another big part of this step is if you look at that blue piece, there's, it's got kind of five five different ears on it, but but one of those is gonna be much more important in working your overall system as all the others, right? So sometimes as you as you, as you do this inventory of things, you might, uh, some people tend to focus too much on the, on the on say the GIS component or one component of the system. And ultimately sometimes you have to open your aperture because these are gonna plug into other systems and some features may have a different weighting in that environment. So it's really important in this stage, it is a puzzle and there are multiple pieces and uh, you're always going to have to make trade-offs in all in each of your pieces, and finding out how to get that end-to-end -end solution and the pieces that fit together the best, I think, is 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 like a, a really big part of of uh, architecting your solution. That's a great point. Thank you. All right. Well, let's then get into. The, oh, sorry. Will yeah. You? One, one, one quick quick comment on this. So we yeah. put, we talk a lot about simplification, radical simplicity, in the way that we approach our software, and and. We're, we're trying to bring that same lens to uh, data onboarding, data migration in, and just just squeeze out the time and complexity and pain because, um, you know, that stuff is real, but uh, at least the way we look at it, we want to it will minimize that as, to as close to zero as possible. And, and we're, we're very focused on that. So I think it's, uh, it's just something to note that um, this can be daunting, like to go from old records to a new system, but... Um, uh, you know, a good partner can make it easy. And we try, we, we're one of those potential partners, but uh, uh, we try to make it as easy and quick as possible, get the data in. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you know, creating, managing, building a fiber network is extraordinarily complex. And the data that goes with it is extraordinarily complex to, you know, the nth degree, right? So um, I really like that, Will, that like, you know, your fiber management provider should absolutely be focused on, you know, bringing all of it down to a, as little pain as possible for the person purchasing that application. So let's talk about architecture a little bit. So one thing to think about when you're shopping is like the future of your organization. So you typically have a choice between um, on-premise cloud hosted or cloud enabled, and then like a cloud native or true SaaS type of platform. And it's something to think about when you're shopping that, uh, you know, we find that like a lot of our customers kind of don't think about that first, if that makes sense. But I think it's kind of like the answer to everything in a way, um, because technology is changing really rapidly. And if you are working on the next generation of fiber, you know, it's going to be around for a long time. So you want to find something that's going to fit with your organization for the long term. So I wanted to kind of press pause here and give the stage to JD to talk a little bit about platform architecture, the difference between these, like what difference it'll make in terms of, you know, how you like sort of manage your network in the long term. Sure. Uh, when you have a solution to be it a GIS or fiber management system or any anything else, you basically have a number of trade-offs you make as, as you move from the left of this, this diagram to the right. Like in traditional on-prem solutions, uh, give you a lot of control and power, uh, but they also have a lot of cost to them as well, right? You have to kind of maintain all that stuff yourself. Uh, one of the challenges though is as you look for other solutions and you look for kind of independent solutions, you find there's a number of kind of ways that they could be implemented. And everyone is a, Everyone likes to say they're a cloud solution, but some of these solutions are, are more uh, flexible than others. And I think one of the biggest things to look at and to plan for in your, in your architecture is basically how your, clouds, how, how your cloud systems can communicate with each other, because that's really where things get, get, get big. In, in, the, in the hosted style environment, you, can, you might have virtual machines or you might have applications that are running in the cloud, but they're just like an application running in your, in your, in, in your premise, and it may be hard for data to flow between two devices, or you may lose fidelity in there. 
and to look for new and more cloud native solutions that are kind of made to communicate with each other. They may have public or private kind of uh, protocols or connections so you can share data between the different steps in your process without having to do elaborate kind of connections or Dropbox dropping files. You can directly communicate while maintaining a high level of security, uh, you know, data integrity, and, uh, and control of your process. It also tends to be more cost effective, right? Because you can actually shape the, you know, the implementation you have. So in looking at solutions, uh, like at this point, pretty much everyone has a cloud offering. The question is, is that cloud offering equivalent to the one next to it? And so looking at your cloud environment, especially if you want to have some of your own environment, a lot of these environments include kind of where you might do your, your machine learning and data analytics if you want to cluster points or figure out where to go next, for example, or if you want to build up a library, uh, a GIS library and create a data lake, uh, having having something that's much more cloud uh, native, uh, built for purpose, uh, uh, you know, built with a, a, a tenancy and security model that's made to scale will really help this process along and help help you as your as, as your project goes from kind of early stages of migration into operation. That's really uh, really important. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's great. Moving to what we've talked about already, you know, you're shopping also for support and services. So you want to quantify how much help you think you're going to need. You might want to do that in hours and people or in budget. You want to take stock. How much ongoing support do you think your team is going to need? Do you have a lot of GIS acumen in-house? Do you have a lot of experience in-house? Or do you have maybe a couple of, you know, um, newer team members who are still in the learning process? So evaluate that team. Um, think about like what the support offerings that are packaged with the product entail um, and then qualify, you know, ask questions again, like I'm a big fan of just sort of ask, 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 you know, you're in charge. So like, what is your approach to data management? Do you have references, right? Like those are all things that you can ask a provider uh, and, and the provider will provide to you. So just a reminder, you know, that when you're shopping for a platform, you're shop shopping for functionality, you're shopping for the technology behind it, the platform behind it that's going to support it, and you're also shopping for, you know, the people and the services that are going to go along with that. Um, and I'm going to jump to the next slide and hey, can, quickly, oh yes. Can I jump in? Because you like your Please anecdotes. Do. Like one of the things, and this is, this, is a, this is kudos to Allison, she's just a ninja here. We're dealing with a pretty hard, uh, hard customer kind of migration challenge. And one of the things they said to us I thought was really interesting says, you know, before you come back to us, if you come back and tell us it's easy, don't come back and tell us, right? This is a real, don't come back and tell us you can do it, right? Look into this, this is always a hard problem. It's, it's, it's always something that has a lot of, you know, moving parts to it. So finding that, 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 that team that, that you can work with and be confident with is really key. Oh, that's really a good point, JD, like making sure that somebody takes a look under the hood before committing to the job, right? Like, you know, review this before you make assumptions, I think is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I would also, I'd also like to add, like, like yeah. it also includes things like um, it not just doing a one-to-one -one of your data into an FMS system. Um, it's also maybe even rethinking, is this the correct way to be doing it? Or is there a more efficient, better way to represent your, your, your network? I love that. Reevaluating the processes that you have in house is a great thing to add here. There's like no better time, I think. Well, we are here at one minute till 2 p.m. So we don't have a ton of time for questions. We did get to a couple of them during our presentation. We do have a question, you know, about is it challenging to get your team to agree to this type of GIS transformation? You know, I mean, um, what is what is team engagement like? And I think we have a hard stop at two. So um, that's a great topic to talk about the next time we come and do an ISE webinar. So thank you so much for having us. We are available to you. Reach out. Um, will Jonas's and my emails are here. Um, if you have questions for Allison, JD, or Will, we will ask those questions on your behalf and get you answers. That's our entire role. If you want to see a demo of our product, hit up our sales team, visit us online, give us a call. And of course, don't forget to follow us on socials if you love quality content and um, the occasional splice pun because we like those as well. Um, so thanks everybody as we wrap up today. Um, we appreciate your time and um, hope to connect with you in the future. Thank you.